welcome back to the channel. This is The Real Country File. This week, Angela visits the farm. She's using robots and diversification. And Stephen checks out a little bit more of Ian Pye's organic dairy farm as well. Anyway, I'm on the combine cutting wheat. If we get a big push done, we hopefully will be done for Sunday night. Hello, I'm here today in a beautiful sunny field in Shropshire. It's the Bradford Estates that I'm visiting today and they have 12,000 acres in total but farm 4,500 of those in hand. So it's actually a, a very interesting diversification project that I'm here to learn more about which they just started last year. So let's have a chat to farms manager Oliver. So, uh, afternoon, Holly. Afternoon. Uh, so, tell us about this business venture. This business venture was set up at the end of last year. Um, Bradford Green is now a company growing wildflowers. So, we're growing wildflower seeds that we will take to harvest, uh, we'll clean on farm, uh, and then producing. The long term goal is to produce wildflower mixes for environmental margins, um, st yeah, stewardship. Uh, with a long-term goal of being able to supply that into more of the retail market for seed bombs or small packets of seeds that people can use in their gardens. But to start off with, you'd be selling potentially to other farmers yeah. for the stewardship. So we wouldn't situation. probably, to start off with, we wouldn't be selling direct to farmers, but we would be selling direct to probably bigger wholesalers that okay. will probably buy the straights from us mm. in maybe 10 or 20 kilo sacks, and then they would do the mixing process. But, lo but long term, we'd hope to be able to do that mixing process okay. as well. So, so what kind of flowers are you growing? So at the moment we've got four different species we're growing. Um, corn marigold that we see here, we've got corn poppy, we've got oxy daisy and red campion. Okay. And, and they're the ones we've grown. So the red campion and oxy daisy are um, perennials which we drilled last year, last October. And then everything we see in front of us today, which is the, the corn marigolds, were drilled with our new robot. And that, I can see the robot in the corner of the field. So let's move across to that and learn more about the robot. So here we are now in front of the, um, the farm droid. So uh, Ollie, just tell us a bit more. Well, first of all, why, why did you buy a, a robot <laughs> rather than just doing it uh, with, with proper people? Yeah, well, there's uh, two reasons. One was um, we, we're growing an environmental sort of wildflower for that we are hoping will end up in stewardship mixes so the one reason was that this thing um, runs on solar so it's it's almost we're running uh, a business that is we're producing seed for the environment and using our farm droid robot is environmentally friendly it, it's driven by solar completely it's got four batteries on it um, it's able to charge those batteries through the day so it can run through the night and that was one of the main one of the reasons. The other reason is we had tried to grow um, wildflowers, the perennials that we'd put in last October, we did in a more conventional system using um, a strip drill um, to drill them and then we've had to hoe them. But they've been quite tricky to manage because we've been trying to, it's okay managing the inter-row weeds, but we've really struggled to manage the inter-plant weeds with the more base or not basic, but more conventional system. Um, so, so you can see a, a definite difference between using the, the robot to do the weeding and just a conventional yeah, setup. It's been a game changer and, and we'll look at a field in a minute that we, we did with a more conventional system. And actually the price of it is pretty competitive. You know, we're looking at £75,000 worth of machine here. Well, if I have to buy a drill, a mechanical hoe, probably then have to start looking at weed wiping and everything else to control weeds in a more conventional system, actually this, this thing pays pays um, for itself in in a few years you know I, I don't have to then find a tractor on narrow wheels put a man on it put fuel in it so yeah it's a complete game changer for, for this particular job and we're small we're, we're not talking broad acre farming here we're talking 45 to 50 acres of wildflowers and actually this thing we can just leave to it. it it does the drilling and it does the hoeing at the same time which is what I like so you can't see at the moment but on normally on here you'll get a, a white hopper which we put the seed in and then that obviously delivers the seed. And, and it's basic, it's just like a sugar beet drill. Um, there's nothing complicated about that. Uh, and then once it's done the drilling, you then take all the hose off. Um, and because it knows exactly where it's planted each seed, it can then go back through and it can hoe. So it can interrow and interplant hoe. And 
the thing we're hoeing, normally the thing we're hoeing, you have to wait for the crop to come up so you can have a camera that spots the rows so you can use your conventional hoe or mechanical hoe in, a, uh, in that manner that it needs to see something to be able to work properly. Whereas this machine, because it knows it's planted the seed there, you can hoe straight away. So as soon as you've got small weeds, you, you send it back hoeing and it just goes round and round hoeing. So what we've done this spring is the flowers we've planted with this machine, we've, we've got three fields that we've used it on, um, and we just, just take it from one field to the other. It's got a frame that goes on a three-point linkage. We, we drive it onto the frame, we move it to the next field, we set it going, it gets across that field. It always has a starting point, which is wherever you want to set it up in a field. So this is the home. So this is where it will always start and uh, finish at. So during the, it will hoe the field, wherever it ends up, it will then make its way back to this point. Have you found any negative aspects to using it so far at all? Um, it's, so seed beds are a big deal for it, seed beds and stones. Um, again, it's like an old sugar beet drill, it's got that conventional um, precision drilling unit that actually doesn't like stones too much. So probably some of our earlier seed beds were maybe a little bit too rough. It needs a bit of a finer seed bed, which is we found this year that we've had to maybe plough and power harrow a bit more, which is pro slightly going against the grain for a more sustainable farming model that we're trying to produce here. So, but overall, really pleased with it and um, yeah, something that's going to certainly make its money back in the long run. Definitely. Yeah, it's been really good. So, Ollie, we've just moved to a different field now. So tell us what's been happening here. So this, this field is a field of oxy daisy that we drilled last, well, it was the end of September, beginning of October, which we thought we might have been a bit late drilling them. We, we were not 100% sure, um, but it was done with a more conventional um, strip till precision drill um, on the back of a tractor uh, with a view that we would then hoe it a bit in, yeah, hoe it in the spring. But what we have, man we have, I wouldn't say we've lost control, but it's been, a lot lot harder to manage the weeds and the inter row stuff is is fine but where we where we've managed where we haven't probably managed as well is the inter plant whereas the robot will do inter row and inter plant so every time it's going down a row it's hoeing a row but then it's shooting off in between each plant because it knows where each seed is um here we haven't had that luxury and and you can see that the weed has taken over and obviously because there's no chemical control we're, we're dealing with poppies and all sorts that, that then grow in these crops and it's been a lot harder to manage. But because it's a perennial, it's, it, it's in for five years, so um, we'll, we'll, we will persevere with it. I think we're learning all the time and we, we've got a better idea of how we need to manage these crops going into the autumn and in the early spring to make sure we get them to flower. But what we won't be able to do is we won't be able to use the robot to hoe these these flowers because uh, it hasn't drilled them. It has to drill them to be able to hoe them. So there we have it, farming with robots. Is it a good thing? Is it the future or not? We'd be really interested to hear your opinion. So let us know in the comments what you think. So you tell us a, a little bit about your farm here. Right. In, uh, in sunny Lancashire and uh, how many acres and that kind of thing? Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, we're organic, um, 250 acre dairy farm, so it's 100 hectares. And uh, we're selling milk to Arla, um, across to McDonald's, which we're quite proud of. And um, yeah, so we've been organic about 15 years, something like that. Uh, and I probably wouldn't go back. <laughs> no? What, no. Made, what made you go organic? Uh, I'll cut straight to the chest, it was the money. Um, there was a premium for milk, and um, right now it's looking like quite a smart move. You know, we're not having to buy, we're not worried about anything in the Ukraine or worried about fertilizer or anything like that. Fuel prices have affected me a little bit, but we don't use a great deal of fuel because cows go out to grass, you know, they take their poo with them and then they eat the grass and fetch it back with them as milk. So it's quite a good system, really. Quite and, like it. And you've got a slightly different system of how your cows go out to field haven't you? Yeah we put paddocks in so it's almost if you went to New Zealand or you know anything about New Zealand it's like a New Zealand system so we've just got a big long um, road cow track that just goes right through the middle of the farm and then they have a fresh paddock every day so they're not poaching soil they can stay go out to in spring earlier stay out in winter later so it means you have to make less silage less diesel everything else uh, and the cows uh, <laughs> I'm not a cow psychologist, but they're genuinely happy cows, you know. And, so. it, uh, and 
that must have been a bit of an investment then, was it? A lot of fencing and roads? Uh, yeah, and... fencing, a lot of time and effort. I mean, we didn't do it all at once, couldn't afford to do it all at once. We've done bits every year, you know, still on with it now and we'll always be fencing. Um, but um, it's an investment that actually has a return on it. Whereas if you put concrete down, you know, that is a massive investment. It's a massive carbon footprint. Um, whereas if we decided to do something other than dairying, we've invested in the farm and the land, you know, whether we're into cereals or something else, it was, that track will be useful forever. It adds value to the farm. And, and the way that you farm, not every piece of land is given up to the cows either, no, is it? No, uh, so you're behind me, we've got um, wildflower mix, uh, and then we've got beehive behind us with pollinators. Uh, probably in the time that we've been organic, uh, and it's very, very rudimental, but I can say that the top predators, uh, hawks, eagles, foxes, everything else, all that has increased on the farm, which is telling me that everything else further down the feed chain has increased. Um, you know, we've like 50 pairs of lapwings on the farm, which if I went to somebody at the RSPB, they probably wouldn't believe me in that sort of number, but they are here, you know. Um, but then we do a lot to encourage nature. We've batten bird boxes everywhere. Uh, if you look over in the distance, we've got an area um, for trees that we fenced off. Um, this stubble, this cereal stubble that's whole crop, uh, we whole crop for the cows. Uh, that's under sown with clover, so that's now it's fixing its own nitrogen, but then we've saved on ploughing and releasing all the methane and carbon from the soil by working it, overworking it. Uh, if we look down at our feet here, we've got clover, white clover. So again, that's fixing nitrogen from the sky and getting us a decent forest and it's free protein, so again, I'm not having to buy protein from Ukraine or far side of the world. Uh, and then, uh, if you look over the hedge here, you probably can't see in the distance, but we've we've done a lot of work on cleaning ponds out, and just making wildlife areas. Um, so, we've done quite a lot. I just believe that the middle of the fields for the farm, the edges of the fields is for nature. Uh, and if we can get the two working together, then we've absolutely cracked it. And, and when you compare your yield and your costs, to neighbours, I'm guessing there's, there's neighbours who are, yeah. you know, who are milking differently and not organic. Do you yeah, I, we're in a, a bit of a costings league table thing and there's conventional farms, there's only two or three of us that are in that are organic. The rest of them are high input, high output. Uh, and we're all, it's all anonymous, but you can see their costings and their businesses and they are running full throttle and probably for a lot less margin than what I am. And I just don't understand it to be fair. Um, it's eye watering, some of it, really eye watering what they're doing. I, I, I was speaking to a dairy farmer a few weeks back who said that looking at the next generation and what he's got, that the debt in the farm, it's a little bit like running downhill. Yeah. You can't stop because you've got to keep it going. <laughs> yeah. I look at these farms and they are, if you were to describe, the best way of describing it is they are pushing water uphill. And if you were to say to somebody, push water uphill, you would say, that is mental. What are you doing? And that is what they are doing, is pushing water uphill. There is a bit of uh, promise, if you will, with prices that are getting yeah. better recently. And so hopefully, yeah. you know, the, you, you know yeah. we'll, we'll see maybe some government changes again. It might get easier yeah. for the industry. Yeah, but yeah. But I still think the fundamentals are that if you look at countries where uh, they've not had any support from the government. They have just been left to run as businesses. Eventually, they've ended up doing grazing systems. Uh, Ireland, New Zealand, where they are proper... I'm not saying we're not proper businessmen in the UK, but they have had to be real business people, or else they just haven't had a farm. And that's where they've ended up. I'm interested to know the premium difference at the minute then. Are you getting a good uh, price for organic milk? A good price. The premium isn't that big at the moment because obviously countries probably possibly heading for a recession. So people perhaps down, you know, step down. Uh, but the premium probably be 8 to 10p uh, per litre. But then we're getting less litres per cow. Okay. But then my costs per litre are less. So you've got to all balance it out in your head that it's costing me less to produce. I'm getting more from my milk but I'm just not getting as much milk. And what, what's a good a good week for you, litre-wise? Uh, well, our cows, not a good week, because we're block carving, so it just goes oh, up and right, up and up, but right. uh, our cows will do 7,500 litres per cow, whereas probably an intensive cow will do 11,000 litres. But then our cows do probably 80% of their milk is coming from literally this farm. 
right okay you know uh, so my costs are very minimal yeah you're not importing loads of fertilizer yeah yeah and exactly yeah, yeah 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 and and what next because you're always looking at environment and new systems and you know you've won awards in the yeah. past for being innovative uh what next is um to, i've touched on it briefly but we're just putting the cornerstones in for the next generation uh, even if they don't want to farm so we're building a house at the moment for the kids which sounds like when they're only little sounds like you know very sort of opulent but really we're putting that house in that uh, I could literally get knocked on the head tomorrow and we might have to get a worker in or something like that so it's a bit of insurance yeah. um, and if the kids want to farm every farm should have a couple of houses on it just to stop any family politics later down the line which all farms seem to have and it never gets discussed so I'm just trying to sort of put stuff in the place put things in place now uh, and then in terms of um, uh, the cows um, probably milk another 10 or so nothing fantastic just manage what we've got really I'd rather keep it as a low labour fun system enjoyable system than start just going mad and getting on that that wheel you know that running wheel I appreciate your time today and we'll maybe he's come and see you when it's a bit wetter weather and find <laughs> out about off. the paddock system then is that yeah. alright yeah yeah always a pleasure to have you back hope you enjoyed that can't really give you a summer barley update because I'm obviously sat on a combine cutting wheat at 11 and a half percent moisture so it looks like we're gonna to have to wet it before we sell it because I think the maths behind it said that every 29 ton of wheat we can only add a ton of water to it which makes it easier for the mills to process but equally it means that we can sell water for 200 to 300 pound a ton the price of wheat so that's what we'll be doing so I have ordered the hose pipe anyway thanks for watching this week don't forget to like and subscribe if you've made it this far and we'll see you next week